We blame Big Pharma for everything. And I'm not here to defend Big Pharma. I know we pretty much lost all confidence in Big Pharma during the COVID epidemic, especially when it comes to the COVID vaccine. Big Pharma fucks us coming and going. Because that was a fiasco. But I think it's important that we recognize the fact that we watch science in real time. A lot of us don't work at research institutes. We're not necessarily familiar with all of the steps that go into becoming an FDA certified drug. And what we wanted was we wanted these big companies to come out with the COVID vaccine in such a short amount of time. Drug development normally takes years, sometimes decades, and we were asking them to do it in a matter of weeks. All of this is because of everyone's favorite love to hate, Big Pharma. Again, I'm not here to defend Big Pharma, but I wanted to unpack the second part of what RFK said in the Sean Ryan show during his interview. And in 1980, we passed a law called the Bayh-Dole Act, and that law said that NIH scientists who work on new drugs get to keep royalties for them. So, so and NIH gets to keep royalties. You gotta be kidding. Oh, no. so the Moderna vaccine, a good example. NIH owns half of the Moderna vaccine. During this interview, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. mentioned something called the Bayh-Dole Act. So let's start there with how we are going to unpack all of this. And I'm going to be honest with you, the amount of controversy that I found during this research is so profound. This shit show just keeps getting worse. I don't know what it is, and I don't know why. I can't just hear somebody say something, do a quick Google search, and be done with it. Because it's during that quick little Google search that I just open a can of what the fuck. What the fuck is going on with this country? So this is part two of a series that I didn't intend on starting. To be completely honest with you guys, I wanted to kickstart this podcast by going through the things that I really enjoyed talking about, like security and health and wellness and my weight loss journey and things that I thought would be be of value. But then I stumbled upon this and I was like, oh shit, we need, I need to make sure that everybody knows about this, or at least they're somewhat familiar, because I'm tired of hearing people, politicians, presidential candidates say some random shit and not know what the fuck they're talking about. Or when I look it up, I'm like, that's not something you can just brush past. So during the Sean Ryan show, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is a third party presidential candidate, made a couple of statements. The first statement was about uh, an herbicide called glyphosate, which is ca is causing cancer, or what he is saying is, saying is that there's a, a really strong correlation between our use of this stuff and the number of cancer cases and the number of aut autism cases as a globe, right? We're seeing that the more we use this stuff, the more cancer cases that we're seeing. So I unpacked that in the first episode. So let's start with the Bay Dole Act. So the Bay Dole Act is also known as the Patent and Trademark Law Amendments Act, which was approved in the 1980s, or in 1980 more specifically. Now, the sponsoring senators were Birch Bay of Indiana and Bob Dole of Kansas. And basically what they were saying is, hey guys, it's the 80s, we're right now pulling ourselves out of the Vietnam War financially, we're in a little bit of a recession, we need money. The government needs money and we have, you know, 28,000 patents that we are owners of that through research that we funded that we're just sitting on. Only 5% of these patents have we licensed out to be, you know, you know, furthered in research or to hit the market. And basically what that means is it was a lot of money that the government was sitting on. It was a lot of money to be made that the government wasn't doing anything about. What a waste of money. These patents had been accumulating since the Second World War. So we had been sitting on this research and these patents for decades. And Bay Dole was like, we need money, let's make some fucking money. But what they meant was, hey, we had these patents, let's sell them to Big Pharma. That is essentially what they meant. So let's unpack this even further. Let's fucking go. So when we look at the U.S. code, specifically as it relates to patent rights and inventions made with federal assistance, that is essentially what the Bay Dole Act is, right? What we're saying is we have 
federal funds through the NIH, the National Institute of Health, taxpayer money, congressional funds, goes to the NIH. The NIH then gives that money in two ways. Internal, the NIH labs, which is intramural, and extramural, which is to universities and to you know research labs. So when a university wants federal funding for a project, they write up a grant proposal, they submit it, and they hope that they receive some sort of grant funding. The NIH spends nearly $48 billion on medical research, and 83% of that, right, 83%, so a majority of that money is extramural research. It's research that's going out to medical schools and universities and, non, and other nonprofits, right, research institutions. And then we have 11% of that that's going to the NIH themselves, because the NIH does have its own research institutions. They have 6,000 scientists at its own laboratories, majority of which are at, at the Bethesda, Maryland campus. Then we have the remaining 6%, which essentially covers overhead, right? That's where the $48 billion goes. Most of it's going out of the NIH, some of it's staying in, and then we have 6% that goes to overhead. This is extremely important. It's going to come up later because the shitstorm I discovered at the tail end of my research is why I was like, hold the fuck on. Hold on to your butts. Now here is where the Badal Act really comes into play. So we have a lot of this money going for federal research all over the fucking place, right? Across the country. Anytime, any anybody that conducts research that wants to apply for grants from the federal government, they apply through the NIH. Now, with the, when the Badal Act went into effect and... They and Dole were trying to get some money for the U.S. government, and they were like, hey, we're sitting on all these patents. What they realized was we can give these patents to the people that are making the discoveries, which makes sense. So if you think about it, they and Dole were like, hey, we have 28,000 patents. Can you imagine how many of these would already be licensed and how much money we would already be making if we just let the university or nonprofit or research institute who made the discovery and filed the patent, if we let them kind of do some of that legwork. Now, that doesn't mean that the NIH doesn't still own the patent, but what it means is they're allowing these research institutions and whoever else to receive money in return. So if someone develops a drug or a component of a drug that could be used, they license it to Big Pharma. And Big Pharma kind of is like, we'll take it from here, guys, and they do the rest of the research. So that doesn't mean that they do all the clinical trials, because in some of my reading, I realized that the NIH does actually do some of the clinical trials. But what that means is the research institutions are now incentivized, right? Not only are you getting federal funding for your projects, you are now also able to receive what I would call a kickback, because you didn't pay for the research the government did. You discovered something and filed a patent, and now you're getting money from the licensing agreement. The NIH does own kind of like the negotiation rights for the licensing, but can you imagine if you worked on a project? You're the principal investigator, it's your research lab, you discovered fucking something, and now and the NIH sells that license and gives Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Merck, Abbott, right? The NIH basically gives those big pharma companies a license to use that to use that patent and now you receive royalties on this multi-million multi-billion dollar deal that's fucking huge because i'm sure if you work at johns hopkins university or whatever and you're a part of this project you just got that university a ton of fucking money and what rfk is saying is that because of that the actual researcher the person in the lab is now also making money. Now their name is on the patent, so that kind of makes sense, but this is how the NIH funding works. The billions of dollars that the NIH gets that they give to other research institutions are used to develop drugs. But here's the kicker. Why the fuck do I still have to pay for drugs, right? Why do I have to go to the doctor and pay for my medication if my tax dollars are paying for the research? That shit made no fucking sense to me. And as a matter of fact, that was actually a really big fucking issue, which we're going to touch on here in a second. So now let's get into some of the research on research. We have one cross-sectional study that found that out of the 356 drugs approved by the FDA from 2010 to 2019, 
NIH spent $1.44 billion per approval on basic or applied research for products with novel targets or $599 million per approval considering applications of basic research to multiple products. Spending from the NIH was not less than industry spending with full cost of these investments calculated with comparable accounting. Meaning the NIH contributed pretty much the same as everybody else in terms of drug development. And when you read that, you're like, okay, at least we know the NIH isn't overspending. But my thing was, who fucking cares? The NIH is not a big pharma company. They're not getting their money from selling drugs. They're getting their money from Americans, from taxpayers. So I was like, that's something to fucking consider. That means that the NIH is spending just as much money as big pharma to develop drugs. But the NIH is doing the groundwork and then licensing what they've discovered to big pharma to kind of take the torch in this FDA drug development relay race. So now I wanted to get into one other thing, which is how much money has the NIH actually made from all of these licenses that they're putting out? According to the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, the NIH received up to $2 billion in royalties from its contributions to 34 drugs sold from 1991 to 2019. But here's the thing. After the Bay Dole Act was, went into effect, the first drug to hit the market didn't happen until 1991. So it took 11 years for one of the drugs that kind of fell into this Bay Dole Act now to hit the market and then for the NIH to actually make money from it. So, okay, cool. So we've made $2 billion in like 30 years. Now going back to this study, they also said this, evidence suggests the public sector makes substantial contributions to the foundational knowledge on which drug approvals are based, but less to patents or development. Conversely, the industry is primarily responsible for product development and sponsored more than 99% of the product launches in this data set. But basically what that means is the NIH is patenting almost fucking everything. All of this is going somewhere, I promise, because there was a huge investigation done so all of these things that I'm mentioning are actually extremely important as it relates to this investigation by the Government Accountability Office. This study continues to say that there is no theoretical basis for applying an equivalent cost of capital to government spending. Basically, there is a little bit of a discounted rate as it relates to the U.S. Office of Management and Bud Budget for government spending. Now, all this goes to say is that Given the evidence that the NIH funding for biomedical research stimulates rather than reduces private sector investment, estimating NIH investment with a 3% discount rate may be most consistent with prevailing economic principles. This shit is written like, like a true budget research paper, and that's fine. But there are some concerns, specifically about public health. So public health experts and patients' rights advocates have raised concerns about the prices of drugs developed with, with federal support. And now to me, that makes sense. And honestly, before I read this statement in the GIO research, which is something that I discovered toward the end of my kind of research saga, it makes sense, right? Taxpayer money, you know, being used to fund research, the research results in drugs being developed and then I also have to pay for the drugs so it's like why am I paying for the research if I still have to pay for the drugs and the NIH says basically that like you know us paying for the research offsets the cost it's a th this three to seven percent discount so it's like they're trying to make us believe that that spending billions of dollars on research is actually really good for drug development and I'll say take this with a grain of salt because while the NIH doesn't consider the affordability of the resulting drug at least there is some research being done. Now, not all research is going into just the symptoms, although a majority of it is. I see, from what I've seen, there's a lot less research being done on, you know, can we cure cancer? Can we cure the common cold? It seems like a lot more research is being done on, you know, how do we help sniffles and how do we help runny noses? And I'm not trying to minimize the actual research being done. It is phenomenal work, but... I think that we have our sights set on how we can help big pharma. Because if you ask me, if I'm, a, if I'm a university and I'm getting federal funding to conduct research, but I also have big pharma 
with their own goals and big pharma is working on these particular projects or big pharma is developing these particular drugs and I happen to have a research study you know being conducted that helps big pharma it would behoove me kindly behoove me no ill behoove You're to take that federal funding to write grants for federal funding that goes towards the research study that I know I can sell to big pharma that makes fucking sense. And because that makes so much sense, there was actually an, a research study done on this. And I'm going to share this chart with you guys if you're watching on YouTube. But it basically shows that the NIH marketed their research to the top 20 pharmaceutical companies in the country. I mean, we have Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Abbott, Merck. We have all of these big companies that are essentially receiving our licenses and then they're developing drugs. Now, Novartis is actually one of the biggest contributors to marketing drugs. They're actually not a US-based company. They are based in Switzerland, if I remember correctly. And they've brought over 1,300 drugs to market. And a lot of those drugs, or all of those drugs, use some sort of NIH licensing. Now moving past that, I, mean, I kind of talked about a lot of different things, but they fall into each of these different segments. So we have the Bay Dole Act, which now allows federal grant recipients to profit off of any patents that they develop. We have the NIH funding and how it works. Now, the NIH has multiple different research buckets. It's not just the NCI, which is the National Cancer Institute. There are other research labs within the NIH. And then we have NIH and drug development. NIH funded lab patents something, patents a discovery. They sell that discovery to Big Pharma in this relay race. Big Pharma then takes that discovery and runs with it to make a drug. That's where we're at so far. The problem with all of these things, as I've already stated, is that why are drugs costing so much money when they're receiving federal support? I'm not the only person that kind of came to that conclusion. There are a ton of public health experts and patients' rights advocates who thought the same thing. So many so that the government's accountability office launched an investigation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is what I'm trying to get at here because the investigation just kind of like ripped open this can of whoop ass on the NIH and the NIH kind of revealed their true colors. And maybe it's just because I just finished reading the Oscar Wilde novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, but it just, to me, reading the statements made by the NIH just seemed so fucking evil. And now I might be a little biased, so please, please read it for yourself and let me know if I'm fucking crazy and I shouldn't have taken it this way, but to me, the statements made were ridiculous. If you go to the GAO website through the link that I submitted, there's gonna be highlights and snapshots. Don't, you can read it, but don't, don't take it for what it says. Open the whole report. It's 80 something pages. It's an easy read because they only write on half the page. So skim through it and you're gonna see what I'm about to talk to you about right now. What you're gonna find is that the GAO looked into the NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services. And what they found is, and this is a quote, research conducted at the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, labs led to 4,461 US patents owned by the agency covering a range of inventions from 1980, they dole act, right, through 2019. During that period, the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, had 93 patents, which was only 2% of the total patents that contributed to the successful development of 34 drugs approved by the FDA and brought to market, including vaccines and treatments for cancer. These 34 drugs were developed by pharmaceutical companies that were associated with 32 licenses granted to them by the NIH. So the pharmaceutical companies that developed these drugs had licenses from the NIH. Makes fucking sense because that's what the NIH does. So that's kind of what the highlights say on the GAO website. They also go into what their recommendations are. But before I get into the recommendations, Let's take a deep dive into the actual investigation that was conducted. And honestly, they did a really good job at this investigation. They brought up a lot of the concerns that 
they received from the public, from public health experts, and from patients' rights advocates. The GAO starts this investigation off by stating that, that the Department of Health and Human Services engages in technology transfer. It's actually called like the Technology Transfer Office, which I believe is like within the NIH which is a process of transferring scientific findings and intellectual property to other organizations for the purpose of further development and commercialization. Commercialization meaning, meaning bringing the drug to market. We already have FDA approval, correct? This includes the COVID vaccine. This is one of the things that was funded by the NIH, that license was given to Big Pharma, Johnson & Johnson, you know, Pfizer, those guys, and then they developed the drugs. Again, it was licensed to them. So the federal government made money right alongside Big Pharma. Here is where a lot of the concern comes in. Since the 1980s, patients' rights and consumer advocates have raised concerns about the price of drugs that include contributions made by HHS-funded research, including that funded by the NIH and the CDC. For example, the drug Zyduvidine was developed as a human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, treatment through joint efforts of the NIH's National Cancer Institute, that's that NCI that I was mentioning, and the pharmaceutical company that conducted clinical trials testing its safety and effectiveness. After receiving FDA approval in 1987, the manufacturer set the launch price of the drug at $10,000 per patient per year, which led to public backlash. That makes fucking sense. And whatever you want to think about the whole HIV epidemic in the 80s, I do tend to lean towards a certain conspiracy theory, but I won't get into that. Basically, it's like we have this life-saving drug and you guys are keeping it behind this monetary curtain that we can't pass unless we can pay for it. Similar concerns have been raised related to contributions of HHS research to the anti-cancer drug Taxol, and most recently with Truvada for HIV prevention exposure prophylaxis, which is PrEP. That just tells me that this shit has been happening for a very fucking long time. This is a very new investigation done by the GAO, which doesn't make a ton of sense to me because if we're having this conversation about PrEP and, and about HIV drugs in the late 80s, it's like, well, why didn't you guys stop this fucking problem then? But I'll continue. This GAO investigation also goes on to say that out of the $2 billion that the FDA has made since 1991, a lot of that money has come from just a few drugs. As a matter of fact, $100 million of each of these drugs, which is gonna be things like Gardasil, Gardasil 9, Prescobix, Prezista, Simtuza. Those five drugs made $100 million each for the NIH. Since the royalties that the NIH makes works just like the music industry, right? It's dependent upon sale. So the more of this drug that's sold, the more the NIH makes. And out of those 32 licenses that I mentioned earlier, so 34 drugs, 32 licenses, out of those 32 licenses, the royalty rates range from 1% to 10%. So they get from 1% to 10% of the sales. And in total, that came to the $2 billion. Now here's the kicker, and I'm, I'm not gonna read these verbatim because it is a lot. The kicker for me was how much money the government subsequently spent on these same exact drugs through government programs like Medicaid and Medicare. But these are two different buckets of money. We have the money going to NIH research from congressional funds and the kickbacks that they're getting, but then we have another bucket of money, which is the bucket of money for Medicaid and Medicare. So it's like even more of our taxpayer dollars are going to Big Pharma. And I'd hate to say that and I would hate to be a conspiracy theorist because I do think a lot of good has come from research, has come from drug development, but I just cannot sit here and justify the money that Big Pharma has made from the government. So it's like when people say, oh, Big Pharma has this congressperson in their pocket, to me now at this moment, it makes so much more fucking sense. Because if Congress is determining whether or not a law passes, it is determining whether or not the royalties are set, is, you know, giving more money to the NIH, whatever it is, Big Pharma is profiting from it all. 
They're getting our money from 25 different ways and we're sitting here trying to figure out how we're going to pay for food and how we're going to deal with inflation and how if I go to the doctor, am I going to be able to afford whatever they recommend? And it's like that should not be the position that we are in considering billions of dollars are going into our healthcare system to help us. And there's a lot of people and doctors and researchers that are trying to do good. And there are a lot of really awesome drugs out there that do improve the quality of life for a lot of people. But it's like the big pharma folks are just rolling in the dough and the dough is ours. What really pissed me off though is the next couple of things that I read in the GAO's investigation. First being that NIH officials stated that the public interest is served best when commercial entities develop the medical knowledge transferred from the NIH laboratories into medical products. So basically the NIH officials are saying what's in the best interest of the American public is that we give our stuff to big pharma so big pharma can make the drugs. That's what that fucking means. You don't know what's good for you. And I don't know why that just doesn't sit right with me. Like, I guess in theory, sure. If you've discovered something, it's best to give it to a larger institution that can continue on the research and determine whether or not this thing can be brought to market. And by determine, I mean go through the FDA process. So, I mean, I get it, but for some reason it just irks me. Like, it really just, it's got me fucked up. You got me fucked up right now. But then there's this part. And this is the part that I was just like, fuck you, NIH. <laughs> According to NIH officials, the agency's technology transfer offices do not consider the price or affordability of a drug based on the agency's intellectual property for several reasons. And they list a bunch of reasons, most of which are just verbatim out of the Bay Dole Act, saying that practical application doesn't mean that the NIH has any requirement to determine pricing and they go into like reasonable terms. Basically what this means is when the NIH is negotiating with these big pharma companies about who's going to get their license, they don't actually say, okay, we'll give this to you, but whatever drug you come out with has to be affordable. And the reason why they did that, according to the NIH, is that it limits the pharmaceutical company. If we tell them that a drug has to be a certain price, it limits what they can do. And that makes sense because the price of a drug is dependent upon how much money really they put into the research. And even though a lot of the foundational research is being done by the NIH, Big Pharma still has to pay the licenses, they still have to pay the royalties, they still have to pay for the FDA process to bring that drug to market. So it makes sense that the NIH doesn't want to stifle that process and doesn't want to limit these big pharmaceutical companies with, by telling them, okay, this has to be a certain price. Now, this GAO investigation does go into some kind of litigation practices and, and giving the NIH this fiduciary responsibility to manage American taxpayer money. So sure, the NIH is saying, no, nah, no, nah, don't worry about it, right? We'll make sure that it's not too expensive. But then this HIV drug drops at $10,000 per patient per year. So it's like, was, did you think that wasn't that expensive? Have you looked at the median income of the American population? And this is why I think the NIH needs to have some more oversight. And I really do agree with RFK saying that he wants to go to the NIH and kind of ruffle some feathers because there is a lot that we don't know about. For example, the American public is not privy to licensing negotiations. The NIH technology transfer officials told the GAO that they do not consider competition after the license agreement has been signed and did not know about an FTC complaint that a company had engaged in anti-competitive behavior while holding an NIH license. That was about a particular incident with the drug Taxol. However, did you fucking know that? I sure didn't fucking know that. For all I know, Britney Spears was on the news during this time, which was 2003. Like, who the fuck knows, right? Our attention was elsewhere, but the NIH does not tell the public, hey, we're going into negotiations. Now, I'm not saying the American public should have too much of a say because a lot of us probably, I know I don't really know what happens during those licensing negotiations, but to me, it sounds like we fucking should. The GAO, however, did go to the NIH and say, hey, I said, hey, NIH, how come, you know, why don't you make some of this stuff more public? I think that would really ease the public's mind because a lot of the people that are bitching and moaning to us right now really just don't know. And you know what the NIH said? Good old boy NIH said, that's too much work. Ah, too much work. This is the exact statement that is in the GAO investigation report. They said, 
NIH official stated that providing additional information about licensing and related patenting activities would involve a significant effort that would further strain the agency's technology transfer resources. Why are you making air quotes? So you're telling me that $48 billion is not enough? You can't maybe kick that 6% you give yourself to 7%? You can't give yourself an extra billion dollars to publish some shit on your fucking website? You have to hire like two people. Are you kidding me? You get $48 billion a year and you're saying that that's too much work? Anyway, they go on to say, while increasing the quantity, quality, and granularity of information would likely increase some costs, it could reduce other costs. Okay, well, 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 you know, we'll give you some credit for that statement. One example is the cost of resources NIH dedicates to reviewing requests submitted under FOIA, or the Freedom of Information Act, by members of the public who may seek information about licensing that NIH does not publicly, does not make publicly available. Okay, so you could decrease the cost that you spend in hiring some fucking intern to answer FOIA requests. Give that intern another fucking job, right? Have him put this information on the fucking website or put this information together. Yes, you could cut costs, but to say that it would involve a significant effort and would further strain the agency's technology transfer resources... Maybe this is just the New Yorker in me and I'm going to remove my professional hat right now, but if they said that shit to me, I would tell them to go fuck himself. But I can't say that to them. The way I say that to them is by pushing for my elected officials to put pressure on the NIH. If you want to continue spending $48 billion getting royalties from Big Pharma, I want to know more about it. Because right now, I don't know anything about it, and that to me, is a problem considering a big chunk of money is going to you. Now, I know this seemed like a bit of a tangent, but that is what happens when you unpack a simple statement like, there is this thing called the Bay Dole Act. And when you accuse the NIH of making money from things like the COVID vaccine, that is, that's something to unpack. Now, I didn't look specifically at how much money the NIH made from the COVID vaccines themselves, but it does seem like they're making a ton of fucking money. And to be, to be completely honest, I'm pretty sure a majority of these financial documents on NIH budget and spending, they're pretty old. So we really have to wait for the newer stuff to come out to really see, you know, how much in royalties is the NIH making from these things. And really, where did that money go? Did it go to NIH institutions? Did it go to universities? Or did it go directly to Big Pharma? These are questions that we should be asking. I am not going to do another part of this, but if you guys did like this kind of content, I have no problem jumping down the rabbit hole and regurgitating kind of some of the main facts, consolidating all of my research and making that available to you. With that being said, I'll see you guys on the flip side. Mm -hmm.